everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I am super excited today to bring you today's show. We have the amazingly talented singer, Broadway actor, and songwriter, Stephanie J. Park. Hey, Stephanie, how's it going? It's good. I'm so happy we found the time to do this. I know. It's a little tricky because your your day job, quote unquote, day job is like complete opposite of mine. You work nights all weekend. Yeah, every, basically six days a week. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so happy to have you on here. I'm not going to lie. I've uh, been wanting to talk to you for over a year now because I, I first heard you I think it was Charlene Kay's podcast, and you were amazing. Oh my God. Yeah, I didn't know that that's how you had heard of me. That's awesome. She's she's my like doppelganger sister or friend, one of my favorite people. <laughs> yeah, you, you actually played her? or so. How did that, what happened with that? <laughs> yeah, so her sister wrote a uh, short series called The Blessing, where I played Charlene, like the big sister, <laughs> and... I just remember meeting Charlie and I'd researched her a little and I was like, oh my God, she's a star. Um, but when I met her, she was so humble, so kind, even taller than me, which I'd never expected. <laughs> She's like five eight and we clicked so immediately. It was it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. But you're gonna be there just kinda I was like, Wow, this Stephanie Park is amazing. She's in the you were at the time you're on the touring company yes. of Hamilton. And now you're on the big show. You're on the Broadway show, a uh, production of Hamilton. You play Eliza. So we're going to talk a lot more about Hamilton. But yeah, so glad we finally got this together. And uh, shout out to Preston Mui, who had a post about you. Uh, it was really cool. It was a post that said, for the first time ever, there was an Asian male. Is uh, Mark De La Cruz, is, is that his name? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Mark Dela Cruz uh, was playing Hamilton, and you were playing Eliza. First time ever, duo Asian Americans playing the leads in Hamilton. And I saw that post, and and I just knew I had to try to talk to you, and we, and we connected finally. So it's so good to have you here. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. I think I'm so glad you commented on the post because I never, you know, Instagram has this extra folder that I've just never <laughs> seen before. And then when I finally found that folder, I found there's another folder in that folder that I had also never seen. So. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really glad you commented because I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I hope you didn't think I was, you know, ignoring you or anything. No, it happens when you when you're a public figure. You got to have the the secret folder somewhere in your Instagram so you don't get spammed every day. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so we are talking to Stephanie J. Park, uh, nicknamed Slay Park, and she is playing Eliza on Broadway, New York City. Um, <laughs> how long have you been doing that role as the as on Broadway? I know you did it at the touring company. Yes, um, I did the touring company. Actually, I was the standby for a year before that, also in a different touring company, and then came to Broadway in September as the standby again. Uh, only did that for like a month or so, maybe a little less until the position of Eliza opened up and then they just kind of offered me that. So I started in October of 2022. Yeah. And and do you have in your mind, do you have like how long you're going to do it or are you just going to do it until they tell you not to do it anymore? Well, we are. So we're offered one year contracts, basically, oh. kind of the standards. So um, I'm I'm starting to think about it. I. I go back and forth for sure. It, it's kind of an all-consuming job, but it's also like very rare to find stability in this industry and to find a job where I really like my coworkers for the most part. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I get to be on Broadway, not on tour, so I get to have a lot more of a life here. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> what, yeah. how much longer I want to stay with the company. But I'm grateful to even have the option to think about saying longer if I wanted to, you know? Uh, no, I I know there's a, there is a line of women who would kill to have the spot where you are right now. So I will say as, uh, as soon as I take it for granted and as soon as I am taking someone else's dream, I will, I will leave the contract, but that's kind of like how I feel about it. While it's still my dream, I'm a keep it. <laughs> and yeah. I, well, I feel like I'm taking someone else's. Nah, totally fair. Hey, hey, can we take it back a notch all the way back? <laughs> yeah. To the island of Guam? <laughs> <laughs> is that your, Is I don't know if that would be your go-to fun fact about yourself, but, you know, if you ever do one of those things where you have to share something that no one else knows about you, do you dig into the, the Guam file and, and pull out some Guam knowledge on people? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if I weren't from Guam, I definitely wouldn't know what it was. <laughs> like <laughs> my ge like my geography skills are extremely horrible. Um, but yeah, I was born and raised on Guam for 11 years, 12 years. And my family was there for like four or five years before I was born even. So um, it was, you know, it's a huge part of me. And it's funny, like if someone asks me where I'm from, I never know how to answer because <laughs> I was from Guam for that long. And then I was in Colorado for like eight years and then Cincinnati for about eight years. And then, you know, so I, it kind of depends on who's asking and if I feel like talking to them, I'll say Guam. And if I don't, I'll say like Colorado or something. Like right. That. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> and so what well, what was life what was life like growing up as a Korean American on Guam? You know, my knowledge of Guam is super limited. So it it's a small place. Did you know like half the island? You know most of the people there and growing up, did people know who you were? Were you singing? Were you what were you doing as a kid? Yeah, it's definitely a very small uh, population and definitely a smaller even community of artists. And so in terms of the choral, orchestral kind of like artist scene, my family was somewhat prominent, very involved. My mom was actually the first Mimi in La Boheme, which is the first opera on Guam, which is uh -huh. pretty cool. Um, so I definitely grew up around music and a lot more diversity. Um, well... A lot more AAPI, right? <laughs> uh, but basically, no black people and almost no white people. Also, so I guess it was just more of like us, <laughs> and that, yeah. that that sense of not being other was strong while I was growing up, which was nice. And it wasn't until yeah. I moved to Colorado that I was like, oh, I am other. I am minority. Mm -hmm. But I definitely grew up singing and dancing. We like, were in a modeling school for a second. It was mostly all classical. I definitely did not know what musical theater really was. But I will say something kind of crazy is that one of my classmates from my private Christian school, Heather Manley, she's also on Broadway now. She's an Aladdin under Sudden Jasmine. And <laughs> it's kind of wild that two girls from the same grade are now on Broadway together from Guam. Yeah. It's a pretty crazy thing. And were there like 100 kids at that school? Like, was it a small school? Or? It was definitely, I don't know exactly the population, but I think like, I think about maybe 80 people per grade. Yeah, something like wow. that. And okay. Classrooms, something, something like that. So definitely within like our school, we all knew each other quite well. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that two of you made Broadway <laughs> from yeah. that same grade, that's crazy. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. We, we like ran into each other on the subway the other day and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. Now, so growing up on Guam, you're not feeling like an other, you're not a minority, but did you have role models that you could look to? Like, you know, there's not a ton of people on Broadway that you could have looked to. There's not a ton of people in musical theater that necessarily looked like you. What right. were your role models growing up? I basically only Sumi Jo. Jo Sumi, she's a Korean opera singer. And she, she was like this huge pinnacle for Korean artists who made it out of just Korea, you know, mm -hmm. and to have her on repeat all the time. We had every single one of her albums, but I, you know, I only had TV to look at to kind of know what mainstream America was like. So again, I didn't know anything about Broadway. Um, and I always only saw, other than Lucy Liu, who was another like, okay, like a hot Asian, that's cool. <laughs> um, other than those two women, the Asians on, on TV were always just like, the nerdy sidekick, mm -hmm. maybe best friend, but mostly like shoved into lockers. Like that was more of the perception I had of what it would be like to be in America. So when I moved to Colorado, I was shocked to not be pushed into lockers, but I definitely fulfilled the prophecy of being a nerd. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Like I wore a knit sweater with a cat on it my first day of school, had my glasses. Um, and I just kind of learned you know pe when I said I was from Guam people were like oh my gosh how do you speak English and I'd be like you know I just learned it on Rosetta Stone in a month it's crazy <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um so so you're you're in Colorado for middle school high school mm -hmm. 
Um, were you auditioning? Were you in musical theater taking lessons? What What were you doing musical wise in high school? Yeah, I was mostly like the choir person, I would say, because again, still didn't really know that musical theater was even an, a career option at that point. And it's so funny, I did do the musicals in middle school and then towards the end of high school as well, but I never thought that I could play the main roles. Um, and it's, it's so crazy to think that back in middle school, I thought I was so behind as an actor. Because <laughs> <And laughs> yeah, you're so old, right? <laughs> right. I was like, I just was like, all oh, these kids have been doing musicals forever. They know how to act. I've never acted. I don't know how to do that. So I felt like a fraud as an actor from middle school to literally my mid 20s, which is wild. Um, so I never played any roles in middle and high school. I never thought it was even a possibility. And it wasn't until I went to college for musical theater that I even slightly thought I could maybe play a role. But even then it was it was only probably going to be like King and I, Miss Saigon or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not that I'm a big deal or anything, but I was a theater major in college at a, at a small school. But yeah, when they had auditions, you know, such a small school that you're probably going to get a part, right? Because there's, <laughs> there's not enough bodies around. But when I auditioned, you know, everyone knew that I wasn't going to be the lead. You know, I'm a little shorter and Asian. And there were like three dudes that just rotated that were always going to get the lead. Yep. And so I, I never even considered auditioning for the lead. Was was it like that at all in the Midwest where you just looked at the, the characters and you kind of went down the list and said, well, I don't know if they'll even consider me for some of these roles? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's weird because it's I don't want to play only the victim in this situation, but I definitely limited myself as well. I mean, yeah. I see other Asian people or people of color my age who also didn't have many role models who did not have that self-limiting belief but it's it's kind of like both environment and myself i just again thought i couldn't act well enough to convince someone that i was good enough to be a white person to play a white role if that makes mm. sense so yeah no I absolutely get it. it yeah it was all of it yeah i i thought if i could play a role it would only be because I could sing the highest note and they needed that, like Cosette and Les Mis. I played that because I could sing the high C. Um, but otherwise, I just never even considered, yeah, I never considered myself competition to anyone else who needed to play those roles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I think, you know, I think it still goes on to, it's changed a little. Yeah. You know, but I think it's, you know, I think in a lot of this country, there's folks that don't look like, you know, the typical person that would be the lead and, and they think yeah. they can't do it. Yeah. But but we're changing it slowly, slowly changing it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I thought my whole it's so crazy that I even wanted this as my career when I thought that all I could be was a token Asian ensemble member. There's always yeah. that token person of color. And that's that's who I thought I was going to be for the rest of my life, which is wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we'll we'll get to the the don't yeah. worry folks is a good ending to the story. But uh, so you you transfer to uh, Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, mm -hmm. and at that point something must have clicked, right? You must have said, you know what, I'm going to make a go of this. Were you thinking Broadway at that point, or at least regional theater? Yeah, yeah, I was definitely thinking musical theater. And so when I went to Northwestern, I was an opera major. But it's a liberal arts school, and I also had a really great GPA, good test scores, all the typical Asian <laughs> things. Um, but I wasn't ready to let go of that academic background yet. And when I decided to transfer to CCM, it was a really hard decision because Northwestern was like one of the best years of my life, honestly. Um, but it's because I didn't want to be limited by only opera, where they kind of say your voice doesn't fully mature un until your 30s, until you can't really have a oh, career wow. until your 30s. <laughs> you have to get your doctorate. Like, oh, it wow. just felt like an impossible career, whereas musical theater was like singing all different kinds of genres and acting yeah. and dancing all different kinds of genres. So it just, it felt like a more open, uh, less limited world for me. And that's why I just kind of dove into musical theater oh, wow. at that point. And parents were on board. Parents said, yeah, go for it. 
Yeah, I'm really lucky. I'm really lucky to have parents who supported me in that way. Mm -hmm. I will say my dad was like, okay, Stephanie, are you going to be the best? <laughs> right, and I was like, right. yes, trembling. <laughs> and he was like, okay, then I'll support you. <laughs> And yeah, yeah. They've been supportive ever since. Even even so much so that when I didn't believe in myself in my mid twenties, kind of had a quarter life crisis. My mom, mm. my mom's belief in me kind of helped pick me back up and put me back together. Yeah, yeah. That's that's cool. But were they also thinking, man, Northwestern, right? <laughs> You're gonna give up Northwestern to go to art school? <laughs> my mom still wants me to mention I went to Northwestern. Even she just like every, she's like. <laughs> Any interview, you have to say you went to Northwestern, especially if it's like a Korean publication. So yes, for sure, for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you know, y y Asian parents, what can, you know, my audience knows, Asian parents, that's all you have to say. But I'm sure they're super proud of you now and, you know, not, not, they don't regret that you made that decision at all. So yeah. So after graduation, what, I, I don't know what happened after graduation, head to New York or regional theater? What were you doing? Yeah, so at the end of college, we do like a senior showcase where we uh, go in front of all these New York agents and managers. You hopefully get an agent from there. Um, but pretty much I auditioned for Cinderella, the first national tour, and I got that pretty quickly. And then while I was in rehearsals for that, I got King and I on Broadway pretty quickly. Uh -huh. So I did Cinderella on tour for a short time. And then King and I for a while, while I was doing King and I, I got, I auditioned for War Paint on Broadway, which I then did after that. And then came the quarter life crisis crash. Mm -hmm. um, and then Hamilton after that. So that's kind of the fast version of yeah. how the career <laughs> went forward. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because if you just look at it, it's like, wow, she never had a, a dull moment, you know, like straight to Broadway <laughs> and playing Top Tim and then Hamilton. But it's it's a lot more than that. There's a lot of struggle in between. Huh? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. King and I was a really interesting experience is where I learned a lot about uh, the hierarchy of musical theater. I was a mm. swing in King and I starting off. And I remember we walked into the rehearsal, the first week of rehearsals, there was a giant room with a giant table where the whole cast and all the creative team sat and the stage managers, everyone. And then there was like a kitty table in the corner for the swings. <laughs> and we called ourselves Hawaii. <laughs> and it started off as a joke because it was so like crazy disrespectful honestly and by the end of the week while they were doing all the un like long boring table reads and research things everyone wanted to be in hawaii with us uh -huh. so um that's it's where i learned about the hierarchy of theater which i'm still like constantly fighting even today like okay. i've been the swing i've been in the ensemble i've been an understudy i've been a st standby i've not been a principal and every single job has been extremely challenging in their own different ways wow. and so because of that i'm not in any way drawn to maintaining the hierarchy i'm very very it's very important to me that the swings feel just as respected as the principals because of how i felt as a swing yeah the other thing i learned in king and i was that this kind of like asian culture that i didn't even know i had so much of in me was hmm not uh seen as that strong in america if that makes sense uh, so uh. kind of this like reverence for elders this reverence for authority figures i was always being meek being humble huh. you know like that kind of like culture that we have and i would be afraid to talk to my director i would be like a different person i couldn't stand up for myself to my stage managers and i learned that that is not respected i guess like mm. that's just not a part of american culture it's like you got to stand up for yourself you got to <laughs> talk to everyone as equals yeah. and not really deal with that um with the hierarchy that is so kind of ingrained in me from asian from korean culture yeah so i i had to deconstruct a lot of the way that i approached um work approached my coworkers, approached the way i saw people and talked uh. to people it's very interesting yeah, because you also, I, I hear it that you're kind of saying you don't want to be that guy, 
but you kind of have to be that guy or you're going to get stepped on, you know? So that's a big thing. Yeah. Cause yeah. I was, I was stepped on a lot. I didn't, I didn't speak up for myself at all. And so a lot of the swings, we all, we all quit that production pretty quickly because we, it was my Broadway debut and it was crazy to feel so dissatisfied at the time yeah. with something supposed to be this huge pinnacle. But yeah, I, I learned that all those values that have been ingrained in me were not valued at all here. And I had to, yeah, it, it was, it was a definite shock to be honest. And it's, I, I'd imagine it'd be kind of weird too, because you're sitting, you're sitting in Hawaii, right? The side table. And like, are the other ki- other people at the table got the black hair and, you know, they got the Asian face too. And you're kind of like, is this, you know, like, is this because we're Asian or is this, you know, because the production is heavily Asian. Asian- ensemble right but but not necessarily the leads yeah it was it was it's funny because i'm never trying to talk bad about anybody but yeah it was definitely not the experience i was expecting to have i guess um i felt like a lot of the i felt like the sentiment was like you you asians are lucky that we're doing this show for you and that might not have been the case, but that's how it felt, I think, within some wow. of the cast. And wow. it was it was disheartening. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That's tough. Yeah. So this is around 2015. Is this kind of right when Hamilton was starting? So like yeah. al- almost literally next door, yeah. you have this other show that is blowing up. Do you remember mm-hmm. the first time you had heard anything about Hamilton? Yeah, I remember my one of my best friends, Blaine, who was playing Burr in a different company now. He was like, yo, there's this there's a show at the public theater. It is blowing up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I've never been in tune with the gossip or like I've never really known like what's happening in my uh, in my theater industry. And so he told me about it. I remember everyone freaking out about getting tickets so funny i was told by a friend that you have to play eliza like very early on they were like you are perfect for eliza you sound just like her um and beyond that so so stupid my pride but because of my aversion to anything mainstream (laughs) i like basically didn't (laughs) pay attention to it at all i did not like (laughs) listen to it i didn't know anything about it until like my acapella group we did a six uh, Hamilton in six minutes or something like that. And <laughs> when I learned that arrangement, that's how I learned some of the songs from Hamilton. <laughs> and it wasn't until many years later that when I changed my agent to a manager and I was like, so everyone says I should be in this show. Like, should I, can I get an audition? And they're like, you've never auditioned. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I auditioned and pretty, pretty quickly got the, got the job. So you had, you never seen it and you auditioned for it? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I only saw it because one of my good friends was playing Hamilton, like, around the time that I auditioned. It wasn't for the audition. I was just like, okay, I guess I should finally see this show because it's (laughs) accessible to me. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because for for me, you know, we're on the West Coast out here. And, um, you know, so it took a couple years to get out here. But the the CD you know, dropped or, well, I mean, you you downloaded it and, um, yeah, just listening to it. So listening to it just because I didn't have any concept of how they staged it or anything, but just listening to the songs and the, the play on words, the play on rhythms and the riffs and the, it was just like, what is this? You know, this is Broadway and it's political and it's, and there's, there's people brown and black and, you know, all different colors of, of beige playing different roles of founding fathers. It, it's just so revolutionary in so many ways. Definitely. It definitely changed the way I saw my career. <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. we just talked to like that token ensemble member. And this was the first time seeing people of color on stage playing roles that weren't me- meant yeah, or, yeah. you know, weren't originally people of color. Right, right. And it was the first time I was like, yeah, I can play those other roles. What am I talking about? Why have I not just me limited myself, but that that opened up the industry to more color conscious casting. Absolutely. The music was huge. I mean, so that good. is I, I feel very lucky to, you know, if I'm going to listen to the same music eight times a week, I'm grateful <laughs> it's Hamilton because it's very good music. It's, <laughs> it's very complex. 
Yeah, so creative. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a YouTube clip of Lin-Manuel Miranda going to the White House and in 2009, oh, yeah. you know, playing for Obama. And the audience there didn't know what to do with it. You know, cause he, he comes out and he goes, oh, here's the hip hop play about Alexander Hamilton. And we're like, what? And people laughed, you know. People yeah. laughed when he started. And, uh, you know, then six years later, it became, you know, the biggest hit ever on Broadway. But yeah, just it opened doors. You know, it's so good to see Philippa Sue or, you know, whoever was in there in the original cast, just see faces and just to hear voices and to say, hey, I can be the lead. I can be someone who's not written as an Asian, but I can play it. You know, that's- Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So when you started, uh, you you were Eliza the whole time, or did you were you other parts in the in the cast? Yeah, so I started off in the Angelica tour as a stand as the female standby, which means I covered the three sisters, so Eliza, Angelica, and Peggy, who also plays Mariah, and so I did that for my first year, and then I did it for a month on Broadway too, but I never got to Peggy Mariah on Broadway <laughs> because I you know changed to Eliza. Is is there a different mindset you have when you play in Angelica? I would imagine there's such different people in the in the script. How do you yes. approach that as an actor, as a singer? It's it's a lot of homework for me. So, you know, I talked about feeling like a fraud as an actor until my mid twenties, and basically, I say that because I found this acting teacher in New York. Her name's Laura Henry. If anyone <laughs> wants to learn how to act. She taught James Gandolfini. She's taught like some <laughs> crazy stars. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, she taught me how to act and she gave me this way to do homework and to delve into characters that made it really accessible. So for every character, I have like per scene, I have my point of view. I have my relationships with my two sisters. I have like what things mean to me. I have, uh, I just have all this homework for everything. So that I, all I do is look at the homework and <laughs> just uh-huh. like, okay, what's my relationship with my sisters in this, in this character? Mm-hmm. What do I want in this scene? What do these specific words, important words mean to me? And then it totally informs even like the way I move my body. Angelica is much more like she stands uh-huh. her ground. She's firm. Yeah. She like commands, she directs. And um, all these kind of actions inform how I move. I sing it with much more, I attack, I attack the songs yeah, bah, a lot bah, bah, more. Bah, bah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the rapping is obviously much more front loaded yeah. and just way more um, voice, way more diction. Just everything is, everything's different. And it's really, it was really fun to play Angelica, which is a role I never, ever thought I would ever play. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But I found so many similarities with her that I was surprised. And I yeah. I do miss her a little bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then what's kind of ironic, you you are a sister of three, right? <laughs> you have the three Park sisters? Yes, yes. Now, which are you middle? Are you baby? Are you oldest? I'm the baby. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, too. I, I find myself constantly in groups of three women, like... <laughs> I have two best friends from my last Broadway <laughs> show, War Paint. We just hung out yesterday. I have like, uh, yeah, every show I do, for some reason, it's like group of three women, group of three women. <laughs> like it's, it feels like home to me, that social <laughs> environment. <laughs> You're meant to play it, I guess, I guess. What's, uh, what's the best part of live theater for you? When, when you go, when you do a show or you watch a show, what, what do you like most about doing live theater? So the thing I love most about doing it is the opportunity to reset every show and the opportunity to grow. I mean, I can't even tell you how much I've grown since the first time I set foot on stage in Hamilton as a standby. I mean, you would hope that after doing over 450 reps of the same exact thing that you get better. (laughs) Yeah. So that's kind of like, it's, it's intense training. It feels like training and Eliza specifically takes me out of my comfort zone so much, vocally, acting wise, all of it. And so having to delve out of my comfort zone eight times a week, Mm -hmm. you're forced to grow. And I have grown so incredibly much. And I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity. I think like a lot of actors say theater is the best way to train. And I I completely agree with that Mm -hmm. sentiment. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. 
All right. I think it's in my contract. I have to ask you this question about Eliza. I think you know what's coming, but you get the last line of the play, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. I've heard other people's answers, but I want to hear uh, Stephanie Park's answer. What does the what does the gasp mean to you at the end of the play? Oh man, I I'm so sorry to tell you that I'm not going to give you a direct answer. <laughs> I, okay, what I will say, so I'm dating uh, Voltaire. He is a an original cast member of of Hamilton. So, and I met him when he was the resident choreographer of one of our tours. And I asked him like, what what is that supposed to be like, or what what did that come from? And he told me that. Elizabeth Hamilton, after Alexander passed away, she would give tours of the house and she would randomly just gasp whenever she had a memory of Hamilton. Hmm. And that's kind of where it came from. That was like the inspiration for it. Uh However, that's not mine. (laughs) That's not how I think of it. Um, The reason I won't give you a direct answer is because I don't have one. It is different every show. Sometimes it's, it's memory. Sometimes it's seeing Philip, you know, my son in the mm-hmm. afterlife and reaching towards him. Sometimes it's like this hope for the future. There's, there's just, that's another thing I love about live theater. It's a different choice most of the time. And so I don't have an answer. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I, I mean, I think that that's what keeps you going and like 450 repeats of the same show. Right. But you can do it different every night and you can think right. about it differently. So I love that. Yeah. Um, so there's not a ton of Asians on Broadway still. Do you do you get little girls, little boys, grown men, grown women after the show coming up to you and saying, thank you so much? Or or I, I don't know what their responses are, but what has been the reaction from people looking at you and saying, wait, she looks like me and she's on stage? Yes. So the answer, the quick answer is yes. A lot of Asian people at the stage door or like in my DMs or in my comments. And it means so much to me, like every single, like it means a lot to me to move anybody ever. But of course, you know, you know, when you're an Asian person, yeah, especially like I'm a full Asian person and Mm -hmm. seeing just seeing yourself represented on stage opens up your mindset like crazy. At least for me, it opened up my, uh, the way I saw myself. And so that's kind of in my most low energy, laziest days, I am thinking about the Asians in the audience. (laughs) That's truly, I'm like, you know what? And not even the Asians. I feel it's it's kind of the burden of representation, right? I feel mm-hmm. I do feel like I'm representing the whole race of Asians right now. So I better do a damn good job, right? <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, it has not been an easy three years for us, you know, just, oh, you know, not yeah. me personally, I say, but um, but yeah, for Americans, Asian Americans. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the history on Broadway is kind of interesting if you if you dig into it a little bit, you know, with in the 1940s and 50s, there was kind of like this, hey, let's do some exotic, let's show like, you know, King and I was in that era, right? It's like, let's show something exotic. And then I think more recently we've seen, I don't know if you've ever seen Allegiance or K-pop. Saw, oh, yeah. Cool, cool. I didn't get K-pop, which is so sad, but I saw Allegiance, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and it's exciting, but it doesn't have, they don't have long runs or like super, super successful runs. It has some success, of course. But yeah. do you do you have thoughts on the future for Asians? I mean, like, you know, Hamilton opened some doors. We saw uh, Andrea Makasit play Anne Boleyn in Six, you know, it's Filipina America, American. And so what, what's the feel on the, on the street? What do you, what do you feel in casting rooms or what do you feel on, on auditions? Do you feel like things are opening up a little bit? I definitely feel like things are opening up. I think like it's, things are opening up on the creative sides end. And I do think that we have to have more, more of us on the other side of the table as well. Um, it's like we need more Asian writers, we need more mm-hmm. composers, we need more directors. Yeah. And it's not that they don't exist, it's just that they're not given as many opportunities. And then it's that like that, what is it called? That cycle where it's like when you don't have enough on your resume, then you don't get the next job, you know. Right. And it's right. that's what really frustrates me because I I just wish that there were more of us behind the table as well. 
I, mm-hmm. I have a lot of hope though, because even in my last 10 years, I mean, I have changed my entire mindset from feeling like the side character of my life to the main character of my life, which is pretty wild. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I'm hoping that that is something that I'm helping other people feel as well and kind of take more center stage in their own lives and therefore like in other people's. But it is it is annoying that our shows don't do that well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just predominantly Asians. But yeah, like you said, I mean, Lin-Manuel Miranda, right? That's why he wrote In the Heights because he wasn't right? getting roles for himself, you know? Yeah. So he's yeah. like, fine, I'll write one. <laughs> yeah. And it's tricky too. Because, like, the Miss Saigon, the King and I is, like, that has given so many Asians our resume. Like, that has given us our opportunity to get on Broadway or on tours. And yet, like, Miss Saigon is my worst nightmare of a show in Mm -hmm. terms of, you know, I don't know if you already have thought about this, but the (laughs) whole, like white savior complex Mm -hmm. just asians being objectified as whores and then you know sacrificing and yeah all like i my worst (laughs) nightmare is to be on stage in lingerie trying to you know seduce a white man that's just not it's just yeah it's it's horrible and yet i thought that that was like one of the three shows i could possibly do right right you know so i do have a lot of hope just just seeing my mentality change I'm really hopeful that that's more widespread, not just me. Yeah, no, I, I you know, and for Asian men, you know, it, there's even less. And so it's like, yeah. M Butterfly, you know, that like, is that really the role that you want to play on Broadway if you're an Asian man? You, yeah. So. Although seeing that was unbelievable. Jean Ha, unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is it is a great role. Yeah. Very specific role. That's not all Asian men. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean he- David Henry Wong. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's hope. I think there's you know there's some good stuff coming. But yeah, like you said, we need writers, we need directors, we need casting, we need you know composers, all of it, just to get some more uh, equity and voicing and, and all that. Yeah. Right. Well, here lies love is coming too. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean that's Filipino, and I don't even know if they're gonna have any non-Filipinos in the show, but it's, it's another, it's another step. And, you know, I'm hoping that that one does well as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's, there's stuff on the horizon. We just got to keep, yeah. keep supporting it. So yeah, right. everyone out there, um, if you're in the New York area or if you're visiting New York, you got to go see Stephanie. You got to go, <laughs> go, go to get a ticket to Hamilton and make people, make sure they know that you're seeing the show because you want to see Stephanie play Eliza. So yeah, I, I would love to get out there. So you got to stay out there. You got to stay in that role long enough for me to get out there and watch you. <laughs> yeah. Send me an email. We'll get you hooked up with a house seat. <laughs> oh, whoa. okay. Now I got to go now. <laughs> All right. Uh, can we, let's see, let's shift a little bit to uh, to your other career, <laughs> your your pandemic career, maybe, <laughs> you know, like you, you were home, at, how, like the pandemic kind of shut everything down, theater wise. So, okay. so you're sitting at home with, with your partner, Voltaire Wade Green, who actually was the dance captain and a swing in the original Broadway yes. cast of Hamilton. Yes. And you guys are just puttering around the house (laughs) we've never not worked before it was a crazy thing we're not called essential and yet we used to have quite high paying job or you know not like right right and careers that we had worked our asses off for and yet here we are just sitting at home with Mm -hmm. no job (laughs) and also no artistic outlet so that Uh was such a different thing but it was such a huge blessing in disguise in terms Uh of we both had the secret dream of writing music, uh-huh. of producing an album. He's wanted to be a producer for a while, and this was his opportunity to finally put all the time in to go from, like, to be more of a student. We are both, like, students like crazy over the pandemic, learning about Logic Pro and, <laughs> you know, watching so many videos, textbooks, everything to learn about singing and songwriting. And... It was pretty cool. Like some of the songs you can, if you listen enough times, you can kind of tell which songs I wrote first in terms of like the melody and the lyrics first versus Uh the beat first. Like um, the ones that I wrote first are a little simpler and 
I would say maybe catchier in terms of the melodies, but then the ones he wrote first are groovy. Like they are like, yeah, you yeah. are in the groove and the beat is sick and you're just kind of like yeah. sitting in this funk. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was really, really, I mean, what a blessing to find a partner who we both felt so safe enough around and also mm -hmm. respected each other's art artistry enough so much that we could clash over all the things that you need to clash in when you're collaborating and learning together uh -huh. and yet produce something that we were both so proud of it feels like our it feels like our artistic baby you know it's like yeah. our first thing that we put out <laughs> in the world that yeah, is yeah. so uniquely ours wow. and no one else's and super vulnerable. If you don't know, we're talking about Saffron Lips, which is yeah. uh, an R&B duo, uh, Voltaire and Stephanie. And yeah, there, there's a little bit of rapping, a little grooving. Definitely, you yeah. can see that he's a dancer, right? And you can, you can hear that he's thinking beats yeah. and how he would move to it and stuff. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he, he, the way he listens to music is so cool. And I mean, a lot of his career is dancing uh -huh. and you can't, it's, Okay, I'm just going to blow him up for a hot second. When he <laughs> dances, it's the sexiest thing ever because he feels the music in him so... So that's like the difference between him and many other dancers. Like the dancers that I, as a non-dancer, I'm so drawn to are the ones that are feeling it. Like yeah. crazy. you see the music in yeah. their bodies and it's, it's their artistry, DNA, yeah. right? <laughs> and he, he is that way with music. And so... It's kind of we that we didn't know what genre to call it because it's kind of pop. It's kind of has a little bit of jazz influence, even a little classical influence. Mm -hmm. Can't mm -hmm. help but have musical theater influence. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite song off of that uh, EP? My secret favorite song is Inappropriate Love Song. Mm. <laughs> but it's not for the kids. It's um it's in a, it's exactly what it's called. It's an inappropriate love song and it's my fa it's my secret favorite because it's my personality which is very silly. I have the sense of humor of a teenage boy so like that's <laughs> kind of like the lyrics of the song. Um, and it was, the pandemic was also like very honeymoon phase for me and Voltaire. And so it's just like an overwhelming amount of love that I just kind of threw at the song with my sense of humor as well. So I, I don't think that's like the most popular song, but that's my secret favorite. Love that answer. Yeah, no, everybody go yeah, available on Spotify, iTunes, Apple, you know, you can get it and just just yeah, put it on as you're driving, put it on as you're sitting around the house. It it fits so many different moods. <laughs> it's very, sh it's very fast, too. I mean, it's like less than 30 minutes for the whole album. So I was shocked at how much work we put into such a short album. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Saffron Lips, the name, where does this come from? So saffron is right, like an incredibly rare, was more valuable than gold at one point spice. Yeah. And it also had this like secret, uh, supposed to help with your libido or something uh, secretly. Okay. And I was okay. like, okay, that's kind of hot. And then lips <laughs> came because I'm obsessed with his lips. And it also, cause he has these beautiful like lips and, and it also kind of helps with me being a vocalist and kind of the voice being the main thing. So put together, we're like, yeah, that kind of, that feels like us, Saffron Lips. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Voltaire, are you listening? You're getting gassed up a lot today on this episode, so I hope he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephanie, you survived our hard questions. Can we slide into our lightning round? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So besides playing Eliza or Angelica Schuyler, do you have a dream Broadway role? My dream Broadway wall has not been written. It's it's an original role. That's what I want. I want a complex character that I am 50% of creating. That's yeah. my dream. No, I love that. Yeah. No, it's it's out there. You gotta you might have to meet the right writer and, and get together with them and, and let them know what you want. But yeah, that's perfect answer. 
Uh, <laughs> so Hamilton the movie was uh, purchased by Disney and is showing on Disney Plus. Do you have a favorite Disney musical or Disney character that you saw growing up? Definitely Pocahontas. Like definitely, definitely Pocahontas. Her hair, it. she was so strong and independent, and just oh, I love her. Yeah, the music is pretty good too. Yeah. It was oh my cool. god, Ooh, and my favorite voice too. My favorite Disney princess voice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you grow up with a High School Musical? Were you a Vanessa Hudgens fan at all? For sure, High School Musical was in high school for me. Yes. Yeah, yeah I kind of figured that's about the range that you might be in. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was kind of cool too to see a you know Filipina American on that kind of a stage. A, for a minute, and, and still, even the kids now know it. But for a minute, that was that was the show. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, great answers on that one. All right, first <laughs> thing that comes to mind when I drop the name. Okay, so Leia Salonga. Uh, Mulan, like yeah. the voice. Yeah, no, and she, for a lot of people, she was the first Asian that we saw. I think she, I think she was Jasmine and Mulan. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. she has two iconic Disney songs. Uh, she was in Les Mis, of course, the original mm -hmm. Miss Saigon. Amazing. And, and yeah. like, she doesn't sound like she's working to hit those notes. Oh, no. It's so easy. It's so easy. Her voice is so easy. It feels like just drinking water. <laughs> that's a good way. Yeah, that's a perfect way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> How about uh, Philippa Sue? First thing that comes to mind. Uh, young, Hapa, ingenue, r ridiculous voice. Also, like every Eliza after her is like, why? Why are the songs written this high? No, <laughs> <laughs> like we don't understand it. But for for Philippa Sue, it fit her perfectly. Well, you've got a little bit of a range too, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes, it's different, but yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, was she? Was she? How young was she when she did that? Was she in twenties? She was straight out of college, so oh. she was like her early twenties. And um, you know, Voltaire tells me that she was really, really sweet and kind to work with, um, which is great considering someone with such young success could be a horrible person. Right. But she sounds. Like, she's really lovely. Like, anyone who I know who knows her says she's a lovely person. Okay, good. Yeah, don't ruin it for us. <laughs> if yeah. you came out here and told us that she's just the meanest person, that would ruin it for all of us. <laughs> uh, all right, last one. Uh, I don't know if you met this person, but what first thing that comes to mind when you think of Lin-Manuel Miranda? A uh, goof, uh, musical theater revolutionary, a go-getter, a doer. Yeah, so influential and yeah. so kind. Yeah, you, you've met him? Yeah, I've met him a couple of times and he's he's really he's like you would think he's not his persona, public persona, but he is. He's just like really sweet and goofy and like knew who I was when I wouldn't have expected that of him, oh, I guess. OK, yeah. yeah. OK, good. Another one that you would have ruined it for me if you told me he was a total jerk. <laughs> uh, he's he's well. <laughs> All right. All right. Last one. Um all right. Can you back up the statement that New York is the greatest city in the world? What do you have to convince me that New York is the greatest city in the world? Okay, New York City has the one of the is mo one of the most diverse cities, at least in America. Mm -hmm. And so you are surrounded by so many different cultures. For artists, it's a dream. You can find any like minded people. Everyone's hustling and it's not easy to even live there. Like even paying your rent is hard. So if you're there, you are working for a dream mm -hmm. and having like-minded people around you with tough skin who are doing everything in their power to achieve that goal that they set up for themselves is very inspiring. Sometimes horrible, yeah. but mostly inspiring. <laughs> cool. Cool. And, and what would you say? Can you back this up? that you would be able to say how lucky we are to be alive right now. What what would you say is supportive of that statement? Huh. How lucky we are to be alive right now. You know, I was just thinking about how I kind of like hate social media, but then in other ways I was thinking about how much it's impacted us and how much we are able to now find what we're interested in, not feel so lonely and speak out for what we believe and have a little more of an equal platform. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want it to be about social media, but it's more that uh, more people have voices than before. Right. And right. I think that 
you know, I, I wish sometimes I wish I were born like 10 years earlier before Instagram <laughs> yeah, yeah, was yeah, a thing, yeah. but at the same time, I wouldn't have had the mentality that we talked about so much in this, which is like that I can do more than just play an Asian yeah. bowl or just be in the ensemble. Yeah. So I'm just like, I feel great that we're in this place now that the opportunities are opening up. Mm -hmm. We still have work to do, but they're opening up. How lucky we are to have more opportunities and more exposure yeah. at our 1000% agree. Cause like, you know, this podcast, right? Would I have had this podcast 10 years ago? No way. No way. Yeah. Exactly. And I get yeah. to talk to you. You know, I met you through social media. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For, for things like this, it's such a blessing. Yeah, really. All right. And we like to end each episode by asking our guests to name an infatuation. An infatuation is anyone in the Asian community, living or deceased, that has inspired you. So, Stephanie Slay Park, who is your infatuation? Whew, okay. I thought about this and had an answer, and it went away in this moment. So, I'm going to choose Charlene Kay because... That woman is a rock star. She's more vulnerable than I ever <laughs> thought I could be. She's the warmest person you've ever met while also like not giving any, am I allowed to say the word Fs about <laughs> what people think of her and uh -huh. she just chases her dreams. Such an inspiration to me. Um, doing that web series, playing her was the first time I had like Asian women at every head of the department. Mm, wow, wow. And I was so inspired. It was on my birthday. I'll never forget the feeling of like, this is the most efficient and safe workspace I have ever uh, had. And a lot of that was Charlene. So I'm going to say Charlene yeah. K. Yeah. And also host of the Golden Hour podcast. You guys can find that on Spotify. So, uh, hey, Charlene, if you're listening, come on my show. I'll interview you. Too. <laughs> I'll, I'll let her know. I'm sure she'd be happy to. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to her too. I'll say, hey, Stephanie named you as an infatuation. So you got to come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Stephanie, this has been so much fun. I honestly, you know, been waiting to talk to you and, and you came through too. You didn't disappoint. You didn't oh. come out as a jerk. You're not, you're not a diva. You're super nice. So thank you so much for coming along. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. This was very fun. Oh, great. I'm glad you had fun too. So everyone out there, go see Hamilton on Broadway and you can see Stephanie J. Park play Eliza on, on the big stage. Uh, it's, if you haven't seen Hamilton, you should definitely go see it. But if you haven't seen uh, an Asian woman, a full Asian woman play Eliza uh, Schuyler, you should definitely get out to Broadway. And you can follow Stephanie at Stephanie Slay Park on Instagram. And go listen to Saffron Lips on Spotify or Apple or wherever you can download music. So, Stephanie, thanks again so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Yeah, hopefully I'll see you in New York someday. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.